So welcome back. I hope you had a chance to think about this problem. We have a network written right here. And what we're trying to do is solve for what x1, x2, x3, and x4 is given the, the partial information. So what we're going to do is we're going to make use of the fact that we have some basic assumptions. Total flow into the network is equal to the total flow out outflow and total flow into a junction is equal to the total flow out of a junction. So we want to take this network and use this to write a whole bunch of linear equations. So we're going to kind of look at this uh, junction by junction. So we'll look at junction A. So how, what is the flow in? Well, the flow in is equal to x1 plus x2 coming in this direction and coming in this direction, and the flow out is 20. Let's repeat our analysis for B. The flow in, well, there's only one thing coming in, x3, and the flow out is 80 plus x1. For C, the flow in is x4, and the uh, flow out is x2 plus x3. And so this takes care of all the junctions, and then for the total network, the only thing coming into the network is x4. And the only thing coming out of the network is 20 plus 80, which is equal to 100. So we have a, a bunch of equa uh, dis equations that can be derived from the flow in equaling to the flow out. And we're going to make that clear in a second. So I'll move to my next slide where I actually did did this. So let's see if I can put both of them on the same slide here. So x1 plus x2 has to be equal to 20. x3 has to be equal to 80 plus uh, x1. x4 has to be x2 plus x3. And x4 has to be equal to 100. So I can take that. And what I get is a system of linear equations. So I did a little bit of rearranging. So all the x's are on one side and what it's equal to on the other side. And so we need to go put it into row reduce echelon form. And you can do this any way that you want. You could go do it by hand. I think that I did this by octave so that I make sure I would get all the numbers right. So here it is in row reduced echelon form. There is the first row of my matrix. Let's write out the second row of my matrix. Write out the third row of my matrix. And write out the last row of my matrix. And we observe that we get a free variable, right? We get that x3 is free. We have no pivot in the last column, so we actually will end up with an infinite number of solutions. And here is how the parametric form, we would get that x1 is equal to negative 80 plus x3. x2 is equal to 100 minus x3 and x4 is equal to 100. So at the bottom here, I've written what a general solution should look like. So a general solution, x1 through x4, will be a solution to this network flow. Uh, if x1 is negative 80 plus x3 coming from here, x2 is 100 minus x3 coming from here, x3 is my free variable, and x4 is equal to 100. So I have, uh, I can rewrite it in this parametric form. So whatever the value of x3 is, I can multiply it by this vector and then add this vector. And I would get a description describing this network over here. Okay. Now, you have to be a little careful when you get these answers because you have to kind of pay attention to the fact that you're looking at a real life situation. You're actually modeling something. So our model here says that it depends upon x3. And that kind of makes sense because you have something coming into the network and we want to know exactly how much goes here. Once we know how much goes here, we know how much goes here. And once we know how much goes here, we know how much goes out. So that tells us what the x1 is. So all the information we need should be captured in the x3. And to make this a little bit clearer, notice that when x3 is zero, right? That's saying that all the input here goes to, uh, to the x2, right? That's why the x2 is 100. The x4 
it makes sense because that's 100 coming in. And this, and this minus 80 here is telling me that, oh, I have to have things going backwards to get in order to force out an 80 over here. Now, normally we want to kind of put some constraints on our model. Basically, we want all of our directions to be one way. So all of our xi should really be greater than zero. All right. So when we saw that if we pick this guy to be zero, we're going to end up with things, things going in the backwards direction. So how can we fix this? Okay. Well, we know that this is the value of x1. So maybe make this a little bit clearer. This is the value of x1, and x1 better be equal to zero, but x1 is equal to 100 minus x3, so that gives me a constraint on x3. x3 can't be any bigger than 100. And then this guy right here, right, this was equal to uh, x2, and that also has to be greater than or equal to zero, but that gives me a constraint of x3 is equal to 80. So if I take any x3 between 100 and 80, I will get a valid solution to my network problem where I won't get any negative numbers. I won't have things going in the wrong direction in terms of my network. So today we saw kind of linear algebra applied to problems in economics and problems in network. So the key idea from today is that linear algebra can be useful. So not only is it fun, it's useful. So I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to move on to chapter two and talk about matrix operations.